The Lord Jesus veiled his glory during his incarnation years on earth. While it is said of God the Father that no one knows the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him, of the Son we read, no one knows the Son except the Father, period. The Son came to show us the Father, not himself, and he awaits the time of his revelation or unveiling. This the book of the Revelation describes. It should be no surprise then that this book is replete with portraits of the Lord. In chapter 1, he's the Ancient of Days. In chapters 2 and 3, he's the head of the church. In chapter 4, he's the enthroned Lord. In chapters 5 through 7, he's the Lion and the Lamb. Later, he's the Word of God, the man-child who defeats the great dragon, the bridegroom, and the judge of all. In the last scene, he calls himself simply, I, Jesus, coming soon for his people. An appropriate subtitle to the book might be, God is vindicated in selecting his son for the task of restoring that which he took not away. Then we shall know that the work he has done in every category is perfect. The father will look on the travel of his soul and be satisfied, declaring he has done all things well. The book certainly presents its challenges. Perhaps this is why God has left an encouragement at the door for us in the form of a blessing, chapter 1, verse 3, to those who hear and keep the words of this book. Look for all seven blessings mentioned in the book. It has been noted that the Lord gives John three divisions of the book in chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, that's chapter 1, and the things which are, in chapters 2 and 3, and the things which will take place after this, from chapter 4 to the end. However, since it is a revelation, it's no surprise that the book is full of open things which seem to add more complete detail to the outline. In chapter 3, there is a door on earth, closed to the Lord, who seeks entrance to our hearts. Ironically, in chapter 2, he's called the one who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Obviously, he has the power to open doors, but wants us to open ours willingly. But in chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, there's an open door in heaven for us, offering God's eternal hospitality, where everyone worships the one on the throne, the center point of everything. In chapters 5 through 8, we see a scroll, and only one is worthy to open its seals. This is the central part of the book, with seven seals and the seventh beginning the seventh trumpet judgment, then the seventh trumpet judgment announcing the seven bowl judgments. This extends to chapter 16. In chapter 9, we see the opening of the bottomless pit, the prison house of Lucifer. And in chapter 10, it's an open little scroll, the Bible in miniature. In chapters 11 through 14, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Within this section, we have a series of historical vignettes. God presents the long war between the devil and his people Israel, as the dragon seeks to destroy the messianic hope. In chapter 13, the antichrist and false prophet are portrayed, who, with the devil, form the evil triumvirate versus the divine trinity. And in chapter 14, we see the mighty harvest of both Jews and Gentiles during the tribulation. In chapters 15 and 16, the temple in heaven is opened again to release angels with seven bowl judgments pouring out God's wrath on rebellious men. This climax is in the destruction of Babylon in chapters 17 and 18, that great religious, political, and economic system built in defiance of God. In chapter 19, again heaven opens, this time for the one who is the word of God to ride forth on his mission to win the last great battle. And in chapter 20, the books are open from which the spiritually dead are judged according to their works. Note the four occasions when John is in the spirit. In chapter 1 on Patmos to receive the messages to the seven churches. In chapter 4, where John sees both what is going on in heaven and on earth. In chapter 7, he's led into the desert to see the end of Babylon. And in chapter 21, John is taken to a high mountain where he sees the holy city. In many ways, 
Revelation is the completion of the scene at the beginning in Eden. Now, instead of being forbidden to eat of the tree, Renim man is bidden to eat of it. Human history began with a wedding in the garden and now concludes with a wedding in paradise. Revelation's throne is also the counterpoint to Golgotha's tree. In both scenes, Jesus is in the midst. The Gospels present him as the Lamb bearing judgment for humanity's sin. In Revelation, he is the Lord finally dispensing judgment on the grace rejectors. Obviously, Revelation is a book of signs and symbols. However, the proper approach is to take each passage as literal unless otherwise indicated. Beware of fanciful explanations. It is difficult studying this book without a working knowledge of the Old Testament, especially passages like Daniel 7. Harold Sinjin suggests there are more than 300 definite Old Testament allusions in the 404 verses of Revelation. He adds that there are 20 signs unique to Revelation and that each should be interpreted in its own context. Whatever the case, don't miss seeing the glorified man who sits on the throne as a prince and a savior forever. And that's our scripture snapshot of the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ.